Welcome to ICAC Live. We are broadcasting from the 51st meeting of the Interscience Conference on Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, and we're in Chicago, Illinois. Today is September 19th, 2011. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm a virology professor at Columbia University, and in the last few years, I've also become a science podcaster. Together with ASM, we produce three successful podcasts, and we call them This Week in Microbiology, This Week in Virology, and This Week in Parasitism, and we fondly call them TWIM, TWIV, and TWIP. So if you hear those acronyms being bandied about, that's what they mean. What we do in these podcasts is we use casual conversations among scientists as a way to bring science to a wide public audience. And among these three podcasts, we reach over 60,000 listeners every month, which is quite amazing for very focused science podcasts. So the ICAC program committee, led by Lindsey Grayson, decided that it was time to bring this approach of teaching to the attendees of this meeting. And that's why we're here today. So the conversation that we're going to have with participants at this meeting is being live streamed on the internet uh, at this moment. It's also going to be recorded. It will be available for everyone, both on the ICAC website, uh, ICAC.org, and uh, through our TWIM venue, which is microbeworld.org slash TWIM. And although there are a great many individuals in this audience, which is very gratifying, far more will listen to this podcast uh, after it's put up on the internet. So this is our opportunity to use this new kind of media to teach the public about important aspects of our field. So today we encourage questions from the audience. We have mobile mics that we'll pass along to you. You can just raise your hand because we have three wonderful participants from this meeting that we're gonna talk with today. Uh, we also have an audience online who are gonna submit questions via the chat room or via Twitter. And if you're on Twitter and you would like to submit a question, use the hashtag pound sign ICAC, I C. AAC, and we'll field those questions uh, as you, they come in. And before I introduce the participants today, I just wanted to know from the audience uh, how you heard about this. I'm gonna give you a few choices. Did you hear about ICAC Live in the program? You could raise your hand if you did. So most have heard about it. Did anyone hear it about it online, say at Microbe World or some other website online? Zero. It's great statistics there. Right? Don't how, need a statistician. How about uh, word of mouth? Did anyone hear it by word of mouth? One. And finally, have you heard of these podcasts before and you thought you might check this out? Yeah, one there. Two. Three. Okay, the majority on the program. All right. So joining me today, without further ado, uh, one of my co-hosts on TWIM from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Oh, Vincent, it's always good to be with you yeah. rather than through, through the uh, electronics of Skype. Right. Uh, this is really a journal club style format. We've all done them with our students, but the challenge with uh, a podcast is unlike journal clubs with students and colleagues where we have figures, this is sort of like describing baseball on radio. And that's what we try to do with our discipline when we take the current papers and really tease them apart. And we ask ourselves questions. It's not rehearsed. And you're going to see today that sometimes we talk over each other because we're so excited about what we're about to do. So I'll pass it back to Vincent. This is why we have Michael on TWIM. It's great to have you here today. And of course, great to see you. Also joining us today on Michael's left, He's professor and chair in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City, Arturo Casadevall. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You're my neighbor in New York, and I never see you. Isn't it, it's a shame, right? Well, we have to go to Chicago. <laughs> yes, we have to come to Chicago to see each other. Maybe you could come and give a seminar sometime. That would be very nice. You can afford a subway ticket. Uh, yes, we can. Mm. It's cheaper than here in Chicago. That's good. No, I know it's not. It's the same. Okay, on uh, Arturo's left, a professor from the Department of Microbiology at Tufts University School of Medicine, Stuart Levy. 
Thank you. Happy to be here. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Curious about what it's composed of and how it goes. As are many of the audience, I'm sure. By the, uh, by the way, are you a pediatrician? No. You're not, because you have the badge of the pediatrician there, the bow tie. Right? <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> well, it, uh, it probably serves it well. It keeps it out of anything yeah. that could carry viruses right. and bacteria, right? As they've done studies on that. Long ties are often contaminated physicians. That's right. And to Stuart's left, uh, he's the director of the Antibiotic Resistance Monitoring and Reference Laboratory at the HPA Center for Infections in London, David Livermore. Hi, oh, my pleasure. Thanks for coming. And David, you kicked off this meeting with a fantastic talk on the first day. It's so important for the lead talk to really do that. So we're grateful that you were able to do that. So we thank all of you for, for joining us today. We know there are other sessions you'd like to go to. Now, just to kick this off, in, in these podcasts, we receive a lot of email from our listeners. They ask questions. They have comments. They correct us sometime, right? Oh, yes. And I would like to read one to kick this off. This came in a while ago, and uh, the, the, re the listener writes, Hi, I'm a big fan of your great education entertainment programs. I would like to suggest to Vincent to invite experts in antimicrobial resistant bacteria in his newly launched TWIM. This problem is very serious, and thus WHO themed their day with antibiotic resistance issue. Likewise, CDC chose a week on September last year to address this devastating health-related issue. Inviting experts and pioneers in this field will highlight and explain inquiries. So that's what we do. We have two experts on, on exactly this topic. So this is perfect. And so people often request uh, specific people to come in uh, and, and talk with us and so we can accomplish that at a meeting such as this. So perhaps we could start with, with David all the way at the end there. You gave an, an address uh, on Saturday, Revenge of the Gram Negative. So maybe you could explain to the audience out there what you meant by that. Surely. Well, bacteria divide into two great families, gram positives and gram negatives. It's based on their behavior in a stain, a, a laboratory technique that was developed over 100 years ago. But it reflects fundamentally their wall structure. Staphylococci, including MRSA, are gram positives. They have quite a simple, if thick, cell wall structure. It's quite easy to get antibiotics in. Gram negatives include E. coli, which causes about 80% of urine retract infections, problem hospital bacteria like Klebsiella and uh, Pseudomonas. They have a more complicated wall structure. It's harder to get antibiotics in. But from the 1960s onwards, we had quite good antibiotics against gram negatives, and by the 1980s, some really good ones, third generation Keflosporins, quinolones like ciprofloxacin, carbapenex. But over the past 30 years, bacteria, gram negatives, have been taking their revenge. They've been getting a little bit more resistant, first to the quinolones, then to the Keflosporins, then most recently, we've had a rise of resistance to carbapenems through the spread of carbapenem destroying enzymes, enzymes like KPC, VIM, NDM, OXA48, all becoming common. This is important because it makes infections due to gram negatives harder to treat and because we're getting very few new antibiotics that are active against gram negative bacteria. So these infections are getting to be harder to, be, to treat. And that's important because so much of our modern medicine, from gut surgery through to transplants, through to cancer treatment, depends fundamentally on the ability to treat infection. You lose that ability, and our modern medicine starts to fall over. So in, in your talk, you <coughs> spent quite a bit of time talking about NDM1, this new beta-lactamase, which has spread pretty much globally. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about its origin as a way of, of teaching us how these, these resistance genes originate. Surely. Well, NDM1, we don't know precisely where the gene came from, but it escaped presumably from some harmless environmental bacteria onto mobile DNA, DNA in the form of plasmids, which can move among bacteria. 
And these seem to have been circulating in India and Pakistan at least from 2006. The first recorded strain with it, though, was from a patient in Sweden who travelled the previous day from India, been hospitalised in Sweden, and was found to have a urinary tract infection, extraordinarily resistant. It was due to a Klebsiella with this enzyme NDM1. It was named NDM1, New Delhi Metallo 1, because the convention had been that with this type of beta lactamase, this broad family, one names them after the source city or country. So a related enzyme is called VIM. Verona imipenemase. Another is Sao Paulo Metallo uh, SPM. So NDM. Well, initially that one isolate in, in Sweden, um, but through the same year, 2008, we in the UK started to see numbers of cases, and through 2008, 2009, we got to 29 cases of infection due to bacteria with NDM1. Uh, variety of bacterial species, variety of clinical settings, some quite trivial colonizations, some true infections, five deaths in the series. What was striking was out of these 29 patients, fully 17 had a history of travel to the Indian subcontinent and 14 had been hospitalized. Some because they weren't in good health and they divided their lives between India or Pakistan and the UK uh, and had fallen sick while they were uh, in India or Pakistan. Others because they'd had accidents while travelling and a few because they'd gone for medical tourism. Tummy tuck in a clinic in New Delhi, for example. Well, David, while you're taking a breath, we have our first question from the internet. Uh, this is from T.S. Odieros. And they write, hello, what are some of the most promising avenues of research into new antibiotics mm -hmm. to fight these resistant microbes? Well, numbers of companies are trying to find new antibiotics, but it's difficult. As I've said, it's easier to get antibiotics that are active against gram positives. Gram negatives have a complicated wall, it's hard to get antibiotics in, and they're very good at pumping antibiotics back out again. But several companies have got an interest. Uh, Anacor, who are collaborating with Glaxo, have got a very interesting series of boron-based antibiotics, which have got nearly universal activity against gram-negative bacteria. Uh, those are going into phase two. A company called Tetraphase in Boston uh, have got some fascinating new chemistry with tetracyclines. Tetracyclines are old antibiotics, but tetraphase have found a myriad ways to redesign a tetracycline. Some of those have very promising activity. They too are going to phase two. A little further advanced, there are combinations of new beta-lactamase inhibitor together with old antibiotics. So a, a compound called Avibactam, which is now being developed by Forrest and AstraZeneca, will inhibit KPC, one of the prevalent carbapenem-destroying beta-lactamases, but unfortunately not NDM1, which mm -hmm. we were just talking about. So, so what's beta old is new. <laughs> well, well, there are two strategies. Either you can take an old antibiotic and try to make it better or try to protect it from things that destroy it. And that's what, uh, no, uh, what um, Forrest and AstraZeneca and indeed Cubist with other compounds are doing. Or you can do what um, uh, uh, Glaxoanacor are doing and take something completely new and try to circumvent resistance that way. Only experience and time is going to show which is the more successful. The advantage of going for the completely new is that bacteria haven't seen this structure before, so you should start off with no baseline resistance. But we know that isn't true, right? Well, if efflux can affect lots of things, but you start with less baseline resistance. Of course, you start with a new molecule, and the risks of hitting some novel toxicity problem are also that much higher. If you start trying to protect old antibiotic, well, you protect it against one sort of beta-lactamase, 
but another sort of beta-lactamase may be able to destroy it. One of, one of the challenges with looking for new antimicrobials is how the studies must be done mm -hmm. ethically because the, the days of placebo, when mm -hmm. a person has a frank infection and you know they have a frank infection, you of course need to give them something else. You can't go mm -hmm. cold mm -hmm. as it were. You can't give them a placebo and, and the new drug. You effectively must um, use another ethical pharmaceutical to protect. And so you're always hampered by comparing and contrasting the old with the new. Does that then add to the cost of developing new antibiotics or the length of time or the number of patients? Absolutely, that it costs something like three quarters of a billion dollars to develop a new antibiotic. And more than half those costs fall in the so-called phase three trials, which are the comparative trials against existing therapy. And so often those trials end up being done in areas where trials can be done rather than in where clinicians actually want to use the antibiotics. So a great deal of time and treasure is expended on trials that are ultimately rather artificial because the patients we want to use the drug in are the most difficult ones who get excluded from the trials because they've been extraordinarily difficult to analyze or they've severe underlying disease. So I think we've got to make the trial process simpler, more efficient. The trial must prove safety and efficacy, but we've sought a sort of very expensive perfection which has actually driven companies away from the area of research and has also erected a huge barrier to entry for new companies that are seeking to develop antibiotics. And that in turn, while it's been done for the best of motives, is actually endangering our ability to treat infection in the future. So you had mentioned before that NDM1 originated somewhere in nature, as do mm -hmm. most of the resistance genes. Um, and in fact, we know from a recent study, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that resistance is at least 30,000 years old because very old sediments have been subjected to sequencing and we can find resistance genes there. So these are very old. They predate our use of antibiotics and I, I presume they're used by bacteria in nature to compete. So how many of these are out there? Should we be looking to get a sense for that, and will that be a continuing source of problems as we develop uh, I'm, new products? I'm sure it will, because we can debate why bacteria or fungi or spe uh, streptomycetes or whatever make mm. antibiotics. It may be that they make them, as you suggest, to compete with other microorganisms, or it may be that they make them as natural regulators of their own metabolism, and they need a complementary resistance mechanism to get rid of excess regulator. Mm. And what happens is that we, or pharmaceutical chemists, seeking an antibiotic, find some streptomycete, makes an antibiotic, we develop that commercially, but within that same organism or related organisms, there's a mechanism that gets rid of the antibiotic, that right. destroys it or neutralizes its ability. And then in nature, that escapes to mobile DNA that mm -hmm. then finds its way through ultimately to the pathogens whose infections right. we're trying to treat. So for, for example, many of the streptomycetes that make aminoglycosides like gentamicin also have the complementary ability to inactivate gentamicin and those same aminoglycoside resistance genes, gentamicin resistance genes, turn up in pathogens causing infections. So we need very much to be alert to this with natural product antibiotics. Stuart, now, Stuart, that leads to some optimists thinking that if we make a purely chemically synthetic antibiotic, it'll uh. evade resistance completely but our experience teaches us, no, it doesn't. Bacteria find some other way uh, around it. Right. Stuart, did you have some thoughts on this? Well, I, I think we've learned a lot about the natural occurrence of bacteria and resistances. I, 
we have a, the Alliance for Prudent Use of Antibiotics, of which I serve as president, had a program and continues a program called Reservoirs of Antibiotic Resistance. And what it says is exactly what NDM1 showed. And that is the bacteria out there that are not causing disease are actually reservoirs of both virulence factors, but principally and largely antibiotic resistance genes. And so it's not surprising that it would eventually get into an organism which causes disease. So what does that say to you? That says maybe we can get a step ahead of bacteria if we look not at the strains that are in the clinic, but go to the environment and look at what's out there. And that's what APUA has been doing and that's what other studies are doing. So we've learned that, that's one thing. The second thing is that I remember 20, 30, 40 years ago, the idea that virulence traits and antibiotic resistance traits would exist in the same organism was just thought to be random and not true. But I think David would agree that really what we're seeing is a coming together of organisms that are perfectly fine to cause an infection, but they're also resistant to antibiotics to treat. So that's double trouble. And that's, I think, something relatively new, too, that's coming up. The third item is, where are the companies that are looking for new antibiotics? And the point is, they're long gone. And the problem now is to get a new rush of interest in creating new antibiotics. What is the reason for this? It's expensive. And the return may not be as much as it is for a cholesterol-lowering agent. So I think we're facing a quandary here where big pharmaceutical companies that have the ways, as David was saying, in terms of doing phase three trials that you've got deep pockets, so to speak, and can do it, versus small companies like Paratech that I've started, which is looking always for a partner because we can't raise that kind of money. So I think the need is there, as you said, beginning. WHO calls it the day, uh, there's a week that's designated antibiotic resistance week. You'd say to yourself, with that kind of uh, notice, wouldn't you think there'd be lots of companies in there looking for antibiotics? Take a look at the sessions here. It's largely small companies that are making their early discovery, hoping to get some other company with money to help move this along. And I think for some reason, this NDM1 gene occurrence, the uh, extended spectrum beta lactamases that are in Klebsiella's and others where people are dying, you'd say, my gosh, there's a need. People are saying there's a need. But where is the money going to find the answer? So well, I think that's a real problem. Well, at the same time, we know our resistance to resistance is futile because the microbes are adapting. But what the what our colleagues in the molecular biology world are teaching us is that the microbiome is extremely important to good human health. And so it's interesting that we're, we, we have a challenge with antibiotics, but should we at the same time be advocating prudent use of antibiotics, only giving them for conditions that merit them to effectively protect our microbiome because the molecular biologists, the molecular microbiologists are telling us that one course of antibiotics disrupts your natural microbiome for two years, three years. And it's really pretty significant if you begin to tease apart the literature that's developing about the importance of the microbiome in good health. So what are your guys' thoughts on when to give antibiotics and, and the role that the microbiome may be playing in this? Should we really be going out there on the antibiotic stewardship bandwagon? Well, well right. cer certainly. We, we, we need to use antibiotics to treat infection, but we need to use them carefully, and we don't need to use them if somebody's got a viral infection. Uh, they don't need antibiotics. It's, it's, uh, it's self-resolving, and giving them antibiotics is only, as you say, going to disrupt their gut flora, potentially select for resistance, and, and potentially indeed uh, to cause other harm as well. So we don't want to use antibiotics uselessly. The other thing, coming through to where somebody has got a significant infection, and they do need antibiotics, where well, I think the molecular biology will deliver over the next few years 
is in much, much more precise diagnosis of infection and identification of the pathogen and its resistances. It's one of the great embarrassments to me as a, as a microbiologist that, that microbiology moves at the same speed that it did 30 years ago when I entered this field or 30 years before that when Fleming was working in it. That you've got a sick patient suspected of being septic, one day to grow the bacteria, another day to find what antibiotics they're susceptible to. During those 48 hours, the patient must be on some treatment. Mm. They're put on something very broad spectrum to try to cover all the likely bacteria. That's made more and more broad spectrum because there's more resistance. Therefore, you know, there's more things that must be covered and more risk that the bacteria will be resistant to the first treatment and get it wrong, the septic patient they're likely to if we can make the molecular biology, if we can replace that classical microbiology with molecular biology to diagnose the infection, identify the pathogen in a matter of hours, we can tailor the treatment so it cures the patient's infection and we choose a drug that does the least damage to the microbiota in their gut and therefore the least disruption to them and to least damage to the public health. That way, we can square this conflict that exists between the individual benefits from the most powerful drug early and society who would perhaps benefit from that drug being conserved to the utmost limits. There's some really exciting posters going on right now about the new emerging field of, of MALDI in rapid diagnosis of what patients have. And they've really gone aggressively, aside from buying the instrument you they've gone aggressively at, you know, rapid ID of potential pathogens. And I think we need to expand the databases associated with them because not everybody's infectious agent is going to be in that database. And that's the argument that my good friends in the clinical laboratory say, there's no substitute for culture. And unfortunately, you got to wait for the bugs to grow. And God forbid you get a viable but non-culturable infection. So it's, it's a really, we, we say this often on TWIM, it's a really great time to be a microbiologist because there's so many opportunities to begin to investigate these questions and I, I think um, Stuart really nailed it in, in terms of creating opportunities for our young people to see a future in this sort, sort of research. Before we go on further, I'd like to acknowledge that this episode of TWIM is brought to you by Wiley Blackwell, the leading scientific publisher of books, scholarly journals, major reference works, and databases. This month, September, they are offering 25% off all microbiology and virology books. To take advantage of this offer, go to wiley.com slash go slash microbe world. That's wiley.com slash go slash microbe world, or check out their Facebook page at facebook.com slash microbiology news. If you go to this page, they have a list of very uh, nice microbiology textbook here. As a virologist, I particularly like uh, studies in viral ecology. Uh, there is also a book on uh, viral evolution. You might like a few of these here as well. They have Michael. most fantastic book selection, and, and you always wonder about uh, Losing yourself in a book when you got to do your real work, but um, books are great. So you can get a substantial discount uh, on these books. So I would check it out. Go to that web page, and we thank uh, Wiley Blackwell for their support of TWIM. I'd like to add one other point here. We were talking about the microbiome and the individual, but quite clearly, antibiotics are unique in the sense that they treat society. They're really societal drugs. Yes. So when we look at the individual and we see a change in flora in that individual taking the antibiotic, let us not forget that the neighbors and the those other people sharing the homes with people taking antibiotics have a change in their gut flora and in their skin flora. So it's not an innocent use of an antibiotic, you really are making a commitment, not just for the patient, but also for the patient's household and for the community. Uh, there's a wonderful study done by Bill Conlop's group, the dermatologist, 
who looked at acne patients in uh, England, and they matched homes with and without uh, spouses or roommates, and they looked at what was the effect of giving uh, an antibiotic, trimethoprim sulfur tetracycline for acne. And what they found was that not only, that was given, the patients taking the antibiotic had a change in their skin flora. But those living in the household with these patients, or these, yeah, acne patients, I'd say, had a change in their flora with a thousand-fold difference in multidrug resistance. This was going on after several months of treatment. So, you know, our vision is we start with the patient because we want to deliver the best drug to the patient. It's very hard for a practicing physician to think past that because then when you have to say, stand back and say, well, there's an ecology here. You've got to worry or worry a little bit about your community if you're throwing out all these antibiotics and you don't have a diagnosis of a bacterial infection. You should be thinking about this. It's because of the fact that you're creating not just in the patient, but in the patient's uh, neighbors and, and uh, housemates, a environment filled with resistance also because bacteria are everywhere. And of course, that applies in spades within a hospital mm. okay. where you have multiple patients on antibiotics and their compatriots in the wards also getting colonized mm -hmm. by resistant bacteria or in a care home full of elderly people who are backwards and forwards to hospital and commonly on community antibiotics as well. Arturo. Yes. There, there's another issue here that when antibiotics have been used in, uh, against infectious diseases in humans, we have basically adapted weapons of the environment mm -hmm. to treating a symbiont. And this is something that I have written about uh, for a while. And if you think of the 20th century, the first part of the half of the 20th century was serum therapy, in which they used specific diagnosis, and I'm sorry, specific therapy for which you had to make a specific diagnosis. Beginning in 1935, and then subsequently with the introduction of the penicillins, we had, we, the field shifted to non-specific therapy. And that, in fact, led to some of the decline in, in, in making a diagnosis. You didn't have to make a diagnosis because the drugs treated everything. But I ask you, and I'm not making, I'm not making the case for causation yet, but there is an association. There is an increasing literature between an association of disturbances in flora with a variety of diseases that are rising. For example, atopic diseases. We are in the midst of an epidemic of asthma. We're in, a, we're in the midst of an epidemic of problems with peanuts and things like that. This was not the way it was. Now, I'm not saying to you that one led to the other, but perhaps we may have changed the flora in some ways as to where some proportion of the population is now developing immunologically related diseases uh, because we no longer have the flora that we evolve with. And if that is the case, we're going to have to think much differently how we're going to do this in the future. We may have to come back to specific therapy uh, and to develop pathogen-specific drugs, and that will require brand new mo economic models to try to get anything like this done. Mm -hmm. Well, let me throw this question out to, to Stuart. Um, the use of antibiotics in improving the farm-to-table times where we give antibiotics that are very similar the, to the ones that we use in people to our livestock to actually shorten the time it takes to raise the animal to use for food. I tried to Google around to find out if there was, are, are the studies out there that support the economics of farm to table antibiotics and the societal cost of what it costs to develop a new antibiotic, what it costs to lose a human life. And do we really have to aggressively look at the f use of farm to table, use of antibiotics in improving farm to table times? Of course, in fact, it's undergoing scrutiny again for the umpteenth time that I've been in this field since it's been 30 years and every several years I'm on another committee to say, we gotta eliminate all this antibiotic going to animals, large animals. And it's not just drugs that are similar, they're sometimes drugs that are absolutely used in humans as well. And there's a lot of resistance out there and there's a lot of selection for resistance done by the use of these antibiotics in raising animals. And why? It's supposed to improve their growth quicker. But in fact, the European Union has eliminated this practice. So it's kind of an embarrassment to me that we still continue. 
I'm happy that there's movement, as there have been, but it hasn't died down. There's increasing movement to say we should ban this use of antibiotics. Some estimate that 80%, 70-80% of all antibiotics by weight are given to animals uh, as opposed to people. I, I'll give you 50-50, I mean, because we don't have the real good data for these. But the point of the matter, Michael, is that this is a practice that is ages old, too old, it doesn't eat, you raise these animals now more hygienically, we don't need the antibiotics. We now know that the use then was not for growth promotion, which is what it was called, but actually for disease prevention. And so if it's prophylaxis, call it prophylaxis and use the drugs accordingly. That is for a short period of time before an event which causes a potential infection, like we do in people. Should but, we take a page from the <clears throat> hand hygiene folks and really adapt strict hygienic guidelines for raising these animals? Obviously, the answer is yes. But <laughs> I'll go for just get them out because I don't think we need them. And Europe has definitely shown that. And I think that uh, the, there's meetings going on all the time. There's a couple bills in Congress. It's going to take a long time. And it already has, counting my experience in the field. We did one of the, we did probably the only uh, prospective study where we st started a farm outside of uh, Boston uh, in the rural areas there and introduced uh, a tetracycline lace feed to chickens and had matched controls and found that this tetracycline low levels in the feed caused emergence of resistant bacteria in those animals taking it in neighboring animals that were there and that the bacteria could move from uh, animal to animal carried by flies where we identify so so there is an ecology in the farm which adds uh, fuel to the whole resistance problem and it's big time because of all the antibiotic that's used so if we stopped today feeding every farm animal in the world antibiotics, what would be the, the impact on resistance? We would see an eventual replacement of the resistant strains with the non-resistant strains. It's not going to be they're going to lose their resistances because these are generally stably held. Mm -hmm. What you're going to see is other bacteria coming in. And we might even think of spraying, as we did in one experiment, uh, live susceptible bacteria into an area and see how fast it takes over. And we could see that it's a numbers game. You put enough in, you can eliminate the resistant bacteria, but you gotta stop using the antibiotic. Probiotics for <coughs> feed animals. Fine, if they work. I have no problem with that. My problem is the use of really good, still useful human type antibiotics for growth promotion. So it's stopping the feed, stopping the inclusion in the feed would remove the selection on this global pool of right. resistance. And, I, and I, think, I think you have to say that there are two things here. There's growth promotion, which as Stuart says, is antibiotics are still used for in the United States. Mm -hmm. and countries in I think Latin America and Asia also, which is banned in the European Union. But on top of that, there is therapeutic use of antibiotics in animals. Sometimes to treat a single sick animal, but often what happens, you've a, you have a couple of sick pigs in your shed, and when you have a hundred other pigs, where well, all the pigs get treated, uh, two of them because they're sick, and the other hundred prophylactically. So there's, there is a big selection pressure for antibiotic resistant bacteria in animals. And for some pathogens, Salmonella most obviously, certainly to an extent E. coli, to some extent I believe Enterococci, that does feed into the human antibiotic resistance problem. There are other pathogens like Streptococcus pneumoniae and Gonococci, where I don't think there's any relevance what, whatsoever. But for E. coli, Salmonellas, Enterococci, that does feed through to human mm -hmm. health mm -hmm. problems. The extent's variable. If we look in the Netherlands at present, you see from humans and chickens, you see the same resistant E. coli with extended spectrum beta lactamases, particularly an enzyme called CTXM1 circulate. Clear link. If, on the other hand, you look at the UK, we have a problem with ESBL E. coli. 
but it's mostly a human adapted sequence type 131 strain, the CTXM15, which is very rarely found in animals, and most probably when it is found in an animal, it's gone from human to animal rather than vice versa. The farmer brought it. <laughs> So how much time would it take for, so you mentioned in your talk the other day, there's a large pool of resistance genes in healthy people. How, if you stopped selecting for them at the farm level, how long would it take for that pool to be diluted so that it wouldn't be a concern? It, it's, it takes a long time. Yeah, a few It'll generations, you, right? Several years, uh, if you're, it depends years. on. There was a study done where, uh, and this goes back maybe 25 years ago, in which they took pigs that had been fed antibiotics in low levels. It was, tetra, uh, it was um, uh, amp, I think it was a penicillin, and uh, they moved the pigs from their current, from their then contemporary environment, uh, 50 miles away to a new environment that had never had antibiotics, and they watched and saw to see mm -hmm. what happened. And gradually, the pigs lost the resistance, the bacteria were associated with the pigs, and uh, you initially lost multi-drug resistance and down to one single resistance, which was tetracycline. So if you change the environment, and we did that with chickens in the study we did in the 70s, move the chickens excreting the resistance to a new environment, a new cage, you would see the loss. If you leave them together because they feed on their own feces, it takes a longer time. So, I'm optimistic because we have examples of where you remove the antibiotic selection and the environment corrects itself. But it doesn't occur overnight. It's the, easier with chickens <coughs> because each generation starts with an egg and you can separate <laughs> that and you can move it away from the resistant bacteria. With the pigs, the piglet stays with the sow yeah. and some of her uh, fecal flora gets transferred to the piglet. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, pigs are harder. What about but people? Even, so once you're chicken, <laughs> you know, you've got your nice clean chicken, you get sick for some reason, it's given some antibiotics, then mm. the selection starts in you. What about people? Is it easier or harder than a chicken? <laughs> yeah, well, it's harder because they demand it, right? I mean, yeah. I don't have a chicken clucking for an antibiotic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nor its mother. Nor its mother, absolutely. Do you mind if I change the no, topic please. slightly? So I wanted to bring in another email that we'd received. Uh, this one is, we have two, one from Carrie and one from Jenny, and they both concern triclosan, one of your favorite topics. The first one was, there's an effort underway to ban triclosan, and she gives a link to that. And I would like to hear Twim discuss the risk benefit to using antibacterial agents, particularly their widespread use in consumer products. Any information on how useful triclosan is, whether we'd miss it if it was banned, would be appreciated. And Jenny also sent the same thing. So when I read this on Twim, Michael said, we have to get Stu Levy to talk. Well, the reason you picked on me is because, in fact, <laughs> when this sort of antibacterial myth began and they were beginning to put a perfectly good antibacterial chemical, triclosan, into household products. Mm -hmm. And they'd have a signal that said, kills 99% of the bacteria. So ima imagine a consumer, that consumer believes that in fact if it's killing bacteria, it's gonna be improve health. Well, in fact, there's no evidence that it does. But we decided to look at triclosan and see if it is this sort of bomb, which it was supposed to be. It does, destroys bacteria in many different ways. And we determined that it had a site. There was an enzyme, a cell wall enzyme, which was the target of triclosan. When it mutated, you got resistance to triclosan. There are other resistances related to pumps that the organism also began to excrete mm. when confronted with triclosan. So it had two different mechanisms that gave you resistance to either the drug or the drug plus perfectly useful antibiotics. And the real question is, has it done any good? And there's absolutely no evidence that it has other than uh, the soap or the water that you wash the organism down the drain with. And what you left with is chemical left in the sinks. And what's really remarkable is that we use this drug, quite, this chemical, quite effectively in the operating rooms where one scrubs for minutes, not seconds. And it's useful there, but its use is at a certain concentration. When it gets into the household, it's about a tenth of that. So you're using low dose whatever, and there's no evidence that it does any good 
to the household or the people, and nobody can show that. So the FDA actually came out with, uh, with an advisory group, which I testified, to say that there's no advantage to chemically uh, adapted soaps and other than use soap and water or an alcohol-based sanitizer. Why alcohol? Because alcohol dissipates, it doesn't stick around, and able to select for resistance. So the, the irony of it all is, this is what the recommendation was. We have not seen a change. We still go to the grocery store and we see all these uh, household products containing an antibacterial. In fact, in some stores and some groceries, so you can't find the, the other, the you kind that was soap. there before. You can't <laughs> find soap. Up, like pure soap, ivory, maybe. Anyway, so yeah, triclosan gets me a little bit excited. Is this I a think US? it's overused and it's a mistake. Is this a US phenomenon or you also have it in Europe? No, it's, well, Europe has done more than that. They've found that triclosan is toxic and so there is movement, I think, in Britain to well, eliminate there's it. There's concern about it, um, but buying a fridge the other year, every fridge in the catalogue is advertised as antibacterial coated, which I take to be triclosan. Well, I got a call from someone in a hot tub. Oh he God. said, I'm sitting in my <laughs> hot tub. <laughs> in the hot tub. I normally put and some Dr. Levy, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm in my hot tub, and in fine print, it says, contains triclosan. Should I be worried? I said, well, have you turned red yet? And they said, no. I said, well, it's either the heat or the triclosan, but be careful. She said, should I get rid of the tub? I said, well, you might think about it. That's, that's the same case. And then there was another call from a hospital that had replaced all the uh, wallpaper and paint in the, uh, in the corridors with an antibacterial triclosan containing plasticated um, paint. And they said, we did this on the advice of our um, health committee. And I said, well, wait a minute. Have you ever heard of Pseudomonas? I mean, <laughs> they love, Pseudomonas loves triclosan. So oh. you're just giving it a real advantage. Oh, really? You think so, doctor? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a little late. All our hallways are now painted. painted. So it, you know, it captures the imagination somewhat. Well, but it, it's a real error. I mean, talk about animal use, now you have this use. People are germophobic and they see this. You ask, is there any difference afterwards? What was wrong before? There was no, it, it just was, the only good thing that's come out of this is that you wash your hands. And I think that comes out of SARS because uh -huh. people learn that if you wash their hands to avoid a viral infection, triclosan's not doing any of that, sorry. It's, it's interesting that this process of antimicrobial is actually regulated by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And it's governed under something called FIFRA, mm -hmm. the Fungicide, Insecticide, and Rodenticide <coughs> Act, because bacteria and fungi are considered pests. And these products that have these antimicrobial claims cannot make health claims. Okay. Those products are only put into things like paints and coatings to protect the paints and coatings from being eaten by the microbe. Exactly. Arturo's good friends, the fungi, right. love to eat paints mm -hmm. because they're plastic and fungi love to eat organic things. But what about a toothbrush that says it's, it's antibacterial? You know where the antibacterial is? In the brush. In the, the handle. <laughs> so if you in the handle. So if there's you, a little asterisk that says in the handle to protect the handle from falling off too soon. How long do you keep a toothbrush? Well, the, <laughs> the dentist recommend you it's should a, get uh, rid get of into one. this field. It's full of laughs, honestly. <laughs> but it's it's because we've made it complicated, and either we haven't, as the discipline of microbiologists haven't really told the general public that you're not protecting yourself, you're protecting this wall from being eaten. And so if you ask a hospital administrator, are you fearing that your walls may dissolve? Now there's science fiction movies out that have walls melting, but to the best of my knowledge, that's fiction and the bacteria have not eaten the paint off of the walls. I would like to uh, culture the walls of that particular hospital. Just yeah. 
And you're going to get the, the extremely scary bacteria like Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter exactly. Exactly. and all those other things that strike fear into any infection control practitioner and infectious disease physician. So I, I would like to end this topic with one thought. Last night uh, I was talking to a journalist and she said, we hear over and over the, the, we need stewardship of antibiotics, we need new ones being developed, but nothing ever happens. So what will it take? Maybe that at a talk perhaps of yours, we saw a life expectancy curve which kept increasing. Do we have to wait for that to start downturning before something happens? No. No, because uh, by then it's too late because it takes <laughs> eight to ten years yeah. to develop a new antibiotic. We, we have to try to, one, to encourage the better use of antibiotics to conserve what we have. Second, to improve diagnosis so we can tailor treatment mm -hmm. even better in the future. And thirdly, to encourage the development of new antibiotics to make it easier for companies to get into this business and to prove the safety and efficacy mm -hmm. of their products. Mm -hmm. so you agree with that, Stuart? Absolutely. All right. Are there any questions from the chat room that we nope. should? We, we've we have? exhausted the chat room questions. So if you're out there listening, please send in your questions. Anybody have a question for any of, of these two individuals before we move on? Well, I'll put a cap on this. Um, I often tell my stu students that the, the microbes gave us 100 years of energy. And, you know, Hubbard's Peak has, has come and gone. And, and now if you go to the general meeting of the society, you find that microbes are making energy force, electricity, literally direct electricity, as well as hydrogen. And I also say that the microbes gave us 100 years of antibiotics. And we've been aggressively using antibiotics for the last 60 years. So we only have 40 left before we run out. And I always challenge my med students and I say, why was your mother and grandmother so fearful of you developing a strep throat? It's ingrained into the genetics. And the reason for that is at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, if you got a strep throat, you had between an 80 and 90% chance of dying from that one strep throat. And so that's why it's ingrained in our, if you will, collective memories that strep is evil. And it's only because of antibiotics that we have forgotten how important all of these things that we empirically discovered before Pasteur and Koch gave us the germ theory. And now we're relearning all of these things. And so I think we really got to get busy in the next 40 years. Otherwise, we're all going to go back to times before Koch and Pasteur. Well, if we had never developed antibiotics, would we still be at 35 years average age or would we have gained some resistance? I think nutrition has a lot to do with it yeah. and because of the Haber process of making fertilizer mm -hmm. that really has has done a lot to increase lifespan because nutrition has increased um, over the last century. Nutrition improved, general sanitation improved yeah. because vaccines came as well and all of these gave substantial gains in life expectancy during the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century before we had antibiotics. So there were big gains before antibiotics. But antibiotics have pushed a lot of classical infectious diseases into history in much of the developed world. Though not so much in the developing world and there's a risk they will come back to us. But secondly, the availability of antibiotics has allowed a whole swathe of modern medicine mm. to develop. Things we take for granted nowadays, gut surgery, uh, transplants, cancer treatments, lose antibiotics, lose the treatment, lose the ability to treat infection. We can say goodbye to all that. Jim has a question. Jim. Yeah, um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat room. Um, oh. One of them uh, went back a little while, but it, it has to do with uh, the field of antibiotic uh, discovery and development. And the question here is, uh, are many young scientists choosing to go into this area of research, even though large pharma companies seem to be pulling out of it? Arturo, since you were the former chair of the careers committee for the society, maybe you'd like to take that one. 
I, I think that there is um, a lot more interest in basic mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance uh, that are being studied today that wasn't studied, for example, when I was a graduate student in the, in the, in the 80s. Uh, but I would say that uh, I, I don't see an stampede of people moving in. I don't know what you guys. I agree. Absolutely. I mean, it, but it's selective because those working for me are <laughs> moving towards that area. You know, uh, they want to go to cancer. Well, okay, but I'd rather you stick with infectious diseases. But uh, no, I agree. The word is right. There is no stampede. In the audience, how many of you work on antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistance? Raise your hand. A handful. No more than that. That's not a lot. Okay. Was there another question? Um, yeah, the other question uh, has to do with, um, I guess, uh, a, a concept in um, antibiotic treatment, which is sort of the hit them hard, hit them fast. Uh, can physicians use a high dose of antibiotics to treat some chronic bacterial diseases regardless of antibiotic resistance? Well, there are some types of resistance you can overcome by increasing the dose, and some you can't. Gonorrhea is the classic example. When penicillin was introduced in the 1940s, it could be treated with just 72 milligrams of penicillin. By the mid-1960s, we were up to using three grams and giving the patient probenicid as well to slow the excretion of the penicillin. So uh, a, what, a 20 something times increase in the amount of penicillin being used by, sorry, 40 times increase. By the 1970s, strains of gonococci had emerged that had the ability to destroy penicillin, and it didn't matter how much penicillin you gave the patient, you couldn't cure a gonorrhea with penicillin. You had to move first to spectinomycin, then to ciprofloxacin. So, if it's a low-level stepwise resistance, yes, you can overcome it by giving more antibiotic. If, however, it's a, a big shift, uh, the acquisition of an ability to destroy the antibiotic, you usually can't overcome it just by giving more. All right, thank you, chat room. Um, Arturo, I heard you say this morning there are one and a half million fungal species at least. At least, that we know of, right, globally. Yet only uh, about 150 of them infect mammals. Maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about that, why that's so. So one of the uh, fascinating things to me is that the fungal kingdom the mo is actually the most successful kingdom in terms of the number of species that it has uh, that are known. And yet most f fungal diseases were not a major problem for humans until the 20th century. Uh, in fact, most of them were described in the 20th century. We don't have histories of fungal epidemics like the Justinian plague or the bubonic death or anything like that. And that raises to me the interesting question of why. Uh, it turns out that fungi are the major pathogens of plants. They are major pathogens of insects. They certainly have no problem killing uh, uh, amphibians. We are in the major, in the major of, of we are in the midst of a major amphibian decline. So what is it about mammals? Uh, the fungi have become a major problem in the 20th century as a result of, the, of things that we do to the host. When we, when we begin to use steroids, when we have uh, invasive surgery, the unfortunate HIV epidemic, uh, and that to me uh, processes the question of why are we so resistant? What makes mammals so special? And uh, it's not only us, it's all, all the other mammals. So I've been thinking about this problem for a while, and I thought that there may be a connection between uh, how we came to be and the problem of uh, resistance. I, I'm sorry, the problem of lack of susceptibility. So should I go on about the... Let me ask before right. you go on, let me ask right. you about the frogs. Right. So we don't immunosuppress the frogs. Right. So why, do, why are they so getting So the, the frogs, you know, frogs have been, uh, the amphibians have been around since the beginning that they were animals, and they've been very successful. They made it, they did very well through the big asteroid, what is known as the KT impact, or the KT event. And yet, we're now in the midst of a tremendous amphibian decline caused by a single fungus that basically doesn't care about the host, goes and kills every last frog, and goes back into the water. And this is a non-specific pathogen. It can take away 
uh, many different types of species. So these are accidental infections, basically. It presumably, it stochastically, a new variant arose mm -hmm. that began to take out the amphibians. So it's not an environmental thing where we have estrogen disruptors in our water supply. We don't think so. I mean, it appears that it may have been spread by human uh, shipments and things like that around the globe, but, but this is happening in, in very uh, virgin reservoirs. Once you introduce the organism, the animals can't handle it. And I point out to you that frogs, like humans, both have adaptive immune systems. They have B cells, T cells, and very, very powerful types of innate immunity. So these fungi have free living forms in the soils, and then right. they also can invade various organisms. How, what is the selection during evolution for that kind of lifestyle? Uh, f well, the fungi, uh, in reality, don't need it. I mean, if you were to remove mm -hmm. all the animals, provided that you had mm -hmm. uh, organic, uh, organic material. matter, yeah. they don't care. Uh, we, don't, we are not dealing with organisms like viruses that depend on the host yeah. in order to procreate themselves. So they have a, it's a very, the, the emergence of virulence in fungi comes in two general categories. For most of the fungi, that, like for example, candida and the dermatophytes, at least foot, you gotta disrupt the host pathogen relationship. Mm -hmm. But surely a frog, in a way, is a quite remarkable animal because its entire surface is a mucous membrane. That's right. Absolutely. We get most of our infections across mucous membranes of one sort or the other. But our skin is dry and it is resilient to, to most, uh, most invasions. A frog has to defend itself in quite different ways because its entire surface is a mucous membrane. And that presumably creates vulnerabilities which uh, don't exist for, for other types of organisms. It, Hence the wonderful products the frogs make, those I antimicrobial guess. peptides. Right. <laughs> if only we could <coughs> utilize them that's in true. some constructive way, but that's, that's a real challenge. So the... But but, I, I would add, but also lizards get into trouble with the fungi. It's not only the frogs. The rep, reptilian reptiles get into trouble, and they get into trouble, uh, well, should we get into the temperature business? Yes, yeah. so I, I disrupted your, your thought, but why don't you go ahead and do that? I have a question, but I'll hold it till later. Go ahead. So it, so it turns out that a few years ago, we asked the, uh, the question about the thermal susceptibility of fungi, and we are not gonna go out there and begin growing thousands of species. Instead, Vincent Robert um, was a colleague in the Netherlands. What he did is develop bioinformatic tools and went into a collection. And what he showed was that the majority of the fungi do pretty well up to 30 degrees, which is ambient temperature. But then between the 30 and 40, there is a very dramatic decrease in their ability to survive. There is a, almost a straight line, such by every degree that you increase the temperature, mm -hmm. you inhibit 6% of fungal species. So if you go from 35 to 36, you get a tremendous amount of protection. So we took that data, and then a mathematician at our institution, Abby Bergman, uh, solved, uh, Max solved uh, the, uh, a differential equation for the, for the cost of maintaining temperature. And the amazing thing was that the temperature that fell out was 37 degrees, almost. Like we were at a set point by which we had maximized protection against fungi but while at the same time not having to eat all the time. And that began to put together the idea that part of the reason that we are here may have been that there may have been a fungal filter in the past. So it now begins to kind of make sense that we are resistant to the fungi. And perhaps, for, and perhaps we got here as a result of, of, of fungal selection. So many of these infections occur in immunosuppressed individuals, right. where the temperature is 37. That's right. Right, and that that is okay for growth. It for some for for some fungi, obviously the pathogenic ones, but they are such a minority of the total uh, sense. So I, you know, here is something that I, I pose to you to think about. So it's pretty well accepted now that. The age of the reptiles ended in a catastrophic event, which is known as the KD boundary, which was either increased volcanism or a rock from outer space. But prior to that, the, the mammals were going nowhere. They were a dead end experiment, had been around for 100 million years or so, and they were you know, just trying to make it in a small niche. After that, the mammals become the dominant life forms. 
But we also had reptiles. If the reptiles were so fit, why didn't they reclaim the planet? They should have. They replicate a lot faster. They need a lot, a lot less food. And the, the other piece of the puzzle is that there is, fungal, there, is, there is fossil evidence for a massive fungal proliferation at the KT boundary. Why? Because all the, all the forests come down. So is it possible that fungal proliferation at the KT boundary gave this highly energetic, highly costly, not too efficient experiment called mammalia a leg up? And then what comes out of it is obviously a resistant type of organisms. And that's why fungi don't, uh, mammals don't have that much trouble with fungi. And fungi, after all, are the ultimate waste managers. I mean, right. that's effectively what happened at the KT boundary. Right. I mean, they are effectively the global recyclers and are responsible for many of our cycling events uh, on, on the planet. And so that, you know, you always have to keep things simple. And that's a simple, elegant solution as to why mammals have gotten that leg up. We don't make any sense. I mean, you have to eat all the time. If you, if you were a reptilian here, you know, you could eat I mean, once a week, you'll be all right. No, but dinosaurs. And there is no evidence that you need to be 37 degrees to think. <laughs> but dinosaurs well, ate a lot too, right? Well, what most folks don't appreciate is that we get four degrees of our body temperature from those wonderful microbes in our gut. If we were raised notobiotically without any microbes, we would be 33 degrees. And so those microbes in your gut that are weeping a little bit of LPS into you actually give us four degrees. Mm. And so it's this complex dynamic of the, the natural microbiome in your gut that actually gives you maybe that magic temperature to resist right. fungi. And then when you become immune suppressed, you know, this is one of these neat experiments that we can propose to the audience to do. Uh, you know, look at the temperature profile of, of cancer patients and ask, what is it? And, you know, track them when they develop fungal infections and see if it's up or down because it's that fine line because fungi are, are really quite specific about the temperature that's best. Right, well, I think it would depend on, on the type of fungal mm -hmm. infection. I mm -hmm. think if, if it's candida, for candida. example, it's already yeah, heat adapted. Yeah, it's adapted to but us. But if it is something from the environment, it could be very diff different. And incidentally, you know, over, uh, there has always been a great debate about fever. It's very clear that fever is essential in, in the reptiles. You give, you give the reptiles a, a fungal disease, they have to go sun themselves. They raise their temperature and they cure themselves. But it's very hard to show among humans a role for fever. And the reason for that is because most of our infectious diseases are coming from other hosts. And so they're probably already hot adapted. But I wonder whether in fact fever is, is, is primarily to protect us against environmental pathogens. Mm -hmm. Because it, once you raise those two degrees, you exclude a whole new set of other organisms. And what's the reason that we give antibiotics to every kid in daycare? So that they can go back to daycare because it drops the fever. <laughs> so um, there have been a number of cases of infection with Cryptococcus gatii in the U.S., as you know. So is this adapted to the higher temperatures? Oh, well? yeah. This, uh, crypto, among the fungi, there are a lot of them that are heat adapted. For example, the aspergillus can, have no problem being in a, in a uh, decaying vegetation when it gets mm -hmm. very hot. I'm not saying that I'm, okay. there is some fraction of the fungi that are quite heat adapted, not all of them, but the overwhelming majority that are potentially pathogenic, mm -hmm. and they're pathogenic, for example, for for insects or, or for plants or something like that, simply can't take mammalian temperatures. So our temperatures yeah. just provide a fungal exclusionary zone. So tell us the bat story, because that, that ties into the Okay, so it ties well. in. So, the, so beginning in 2006, uh, people who go into cave began to notice in the Northeast large numbers of dead bats. And the bat in the summer is 37 degrees. It's flying around, it's like you. Then in the winter, though, what it does when there is not enough food is, is adapted hibernation strategy, by which, as you know, they, they go into hibernation and their temperature drops to 10 to 15 degrees, 10 to 12 degrees. And at that, when they get, when they get cold, they're susceptible to a fungus. 
a Geomyces species, Geomyces destructans, which is now beginning to wipe out bad colonies. Uh, and it's, a, it's going to become a tremendous problem, I think, in the future, and it may lead to the extinction of some bad species. So why did this just happen recently? Do we understand the trigger? We don't understand the trigger, but it may be similar to, this, to the, what happened with the amphibian declines. That is, that the mm. fungi are highly recombinogenic, uh, that there are new clades that are emerging all the time, and that this organism somehow managed to find a niche within a bat cave, and the bats are very social animals. They're mammals, they're, they're like us. They go around, they spread it, and now the bat populations in the United States are in big trouble. Mm. But there's no evidence that we have intervened no. and caused this, as Michael had suggested earlier. Well, I mean, it could be something as simple as global warming. I mean, it could have been that it, we, if, it could have been that people brought it into, clay, yeah. into, into caves, the caves or something like that. Right. Sure, okay. But, uh, but right now, there's no evidence for that. So I want, I want to return to my earlier thought, which was the, the fungi are, are living in the soil, but they have an amazing intracellular pathway. And we talked about this on a twim, a cryptococcus uh, of almost cytosis, right? Oh, yeah. Right. This is actually your, your right. paper from your lab. We discussed this on an earlier one. So I want to know how this complicated pathway has evolved in a fungus that's living in, in the soil. What's the pressure for that? So the story is that if you take the, the fungi that are pathogenic for humans, if you take them to the laboratory and you study them, organisms like Histoplasma capsularum, Cryptococcus neoformum, Blastomyces, Dermatitis, what, what you find is amazing complexity. You find their ability to get into macrophages, take down macrophages, get in, get out, and the whole story doesn't make any sense. Because if they're living in the soil, why should they have developed a strategy to get into a macrophage and basically do to them what viruses do to them? For viruses, you can understand it because viruses have to survive in, in their host. So it turns out that many of these things can be replicated in amoeba. So the evolving story is that amoeba are fungal predators. And amoeba are out there interacting with the fungi. And the fungi develop strategies for surviving against amoeba. Now, think about all the species out there that are under amoeba selection. Now, you get some of these species, you give them the ability to be 37 degrees, you give them a couple of other things so they can get around the immune system, and you have a human pathogen. And then it appears that they have been very sophisticated and almost tailor-made to cause disease, when in fact what you have is accidental virulence. You have the, mm -hmm. the, you have the, the selection of traits that are capable of causing disease by other means. These things did not co-evolve with us. So the, the fungi have evolved to be resistant to being eaten by the amoeba. That's right. But they have also acquired the ability to multiply inside of them. Amoeba, right. And then they get into a macrophage in your lung and they say, ah, I ran into a different type of amoeba. I know this place. Yes. <laughs> so that's amazing to me right. that what, happened, what has evolved in an amoeba then works. Right. In people, but the processes that, aren't identical, right? Vincent, that's because you're a virologist. <laughs> and, 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 vir and, and from a virology point of view, there is so much specificity. Are there other examples Ex of such a evolution that provides an advantage elsewhere? Well, I guess, I guess a legionella will okay, be an example. Sure. Listeria. Right. Uh, but, sh but surely virtually all the opportunist pathogens, mm -hmm. that all the acinetobacters and pseudomonas that we now see as hospital pathogens, that they, they were not classical pathogens in the way that, uh, that, that, that cholera or typhoid was, right. they are pathogens because we manage to keep people alive nowadays yes. with very, very debilitated defenses and these organisms c can invade. They can it's, adapt. It's pure opportunistic pathogen and likewise it's opportunism that an organism that's evolved to uh, evade uh, soil amoebae can also evade uh, human macrophages. Yeah, I, I went to graduate school during the beginnings of the HIV epidemic, and we never heard about pneumocystis. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the 90s, it just exploded. And again, this opportunistic, and now it's a fungus, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, just, you know, the scariest thing for uh, an HIV patient. Mm -hmm. But it's how evolution works. That's right. That new opportunities emerge, yeah. nature abhors a vacuum, and some organism can expand within that opportunity. 
sometimes very much to the harm of human individuals. Sure. It would be nice if we could predict that. It yes. Well, think so maybe we should be thinking about how. I mean, what I was mentioning was for resistance, we can predict it if we know what the environment has. Right. In terms of the evolution of a new pathogen, I'm not sure. Well, temperature, I think, may be the key because, you know, if you consider the fine structure of the macrophage in the lung, this is another thing that we talked about on TWIM, is the macrophage is really outside of the body in the lung. Mm -hmm. So it's not really, you know, hot 37 degrees. No, I think it, it's pretty hot in there. Well, it's, it's hot in there, but, you know, you go back to the, the level of temperature sensitivity that allows it to effectively establish itself. And then if there's enough of them, they get the foothold. And it's like any good invading army, once you establish your beachhead, you just bring reinforcements. And the way the fungi and the bacteria do it is just like you make Doritos, they just make more. Mm -hmm. Well, more than that, <laughs> because once they've started to grow, then they signal to each other. Oh, so yeah. initially, mm -hmm. an organism grows, uh, you know, try not to provoke its host too much, but once there's a sufficient density of bacteria, they signal to each other, and that's when they start making the tissue-destroying enzymes. Quorum sensing is, is really a scary concept if you really consider the whole infectious disease paradigm. Calling your friends and neighbors to come help you make the infection better. Absolutely. So, Arturo, you had mentioned that... There's um, a question, Mike. Oh, a question. Oh. Very good. Yes. Thank you. Just a question, there is a lot of expectation coming from what the vaccine will deliver in this area. Are we sure we have under control the effect of creating vacuum from many species? And what could be next uh, invader? It's oh. a very good question, and it's one that is raised with the strep pneumonia story, where you have a vaccine that's very effective, but what happens is you get rid of a group of serotypes and another one steps in. And the question is, now we treat those and we now have a broader spectrum with more serotypes. What eventually will take over? Will it be an Ammophilus? Will it be another uh, strep? What will it be? And do we think about that? Well, I'd like to think that we, we, we weigh the benefit versus uh, the harm. And I think that the vaccine has clearly been effective, both for that and the Haemophilus. So uh, with the Haemophilus, the more pathogenics are, the type B is gone, and the less take its place. And maybe we should stop right there. That's what I think. Don't, don't bother mustering with this anymore. Just let, let it exist like that. With the pneumococcus, many, many more types. The question is, when would you think of stopping? And if this now form 19A, which is both virulent and resistant, is dominant, then we should take care of that. But being careful and trying to understand the serotypes that replace during and after vaccine trial, after vaccine vaccination. Okay. Surely looking at the, the history of vaccines, which, which now goes back, what, 200 years to Jenner, there have been very, very few real escapes of pathogens from vaccine cover. Once a vaccine's been developed, it stood the test of time. The pneumococcal vaccine, I think, is an unusual one simply because it's serotype specific. Uh, and as Stuart said, we, uh, um, the vaccines are being redesigned to cover more and more uh, serotypes. But that, that's a reflection of developing a serotype specific vaccine. Uh, on the whole, vaccines have been remarkably good, and it's been especially unknown for, for pathogens to escape them. How far you can go overcoming pathogens with vaccines is much more debatable, because once we start looking at Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Enterobacter, Klebsiella, the types of bacteria that cause opportunistic infections in our hospital patients well, one, is it cost-effective to vaccinate large numbers of people? Two, the people who get infections with these pathogens often have a, an impaired immune response anyway. Mm -hmm. So will the vaccine continue? And if you go to something like E. coli, do you need to get a vaccine which covers uh, just the strains 
that give uh, infection of the urinary tract or the ones that give gastrointestinal disease whilst avoiding giving uh, a, a, any, uh, avoiding provoking or eliminating those that live harmlessly in the gut. So I think other issues do come in there, but on the whole the story with vaccines has been very positive but very hard to expand into all the organisms that now threaten us one way or another. Specific to your question, my colleagues in Tbilisi, Georgia, who uh, advocate phage, bacteriophage therapy, they routinely go back to their river and isolate bacteriophage because they know that the, their, the utility of this antimicrobial application of phage is limited because you effectively deplete out those strains that are sensitive to the phage and they go back to the river to get a new batch of phage. But from the perspective of developing ethical pharmaceuticals, it's an extreme challenge because just imagine taking something through trials where you have to develop it on a monthly cycle. It would just go crazy. And the folks in uh, Tbilisi actually do that routinely and they have phage cocktails and they are cocktails because they understand the ecology of their treatment targets. And they have a cocktail that they prescribe and they constantly are refreshing. So this is the constant turnover of the antimicrobial. So that, I think, speaks to your question about vaccine escape. But, the, but this also gets back to how our expectations Absolutely. have changed over the past 60 or 70, past 70 years of the antimicrobial era. That's right. That um, now we demand absolute perfection and, and safety in how something is developed, how it's produced. Go back to when penicillin was being developed in the 1940s. And it was very much a development process of not, not dissimilar to what you described now for Farge, but would be politically unacceptable, I think, in, in modern consumer society here or in Western Europe. Well, we've spoiled, we've been spoiled by the golden era of antimicrobials in that they have been tremendously effective and very, very safe. Absolutely. We have, we have, we, we, we've come to take that as a given. Yes. We right. have a question from uh, yeah. online. We have uh, one more question from the chat room. Uh, I guess this is going back to a previous conversation concerning improved living conditions. Uh, the viewer is wondering if the panel would comment on the possible rapid evolution in pathogenicity in developing nations where living conditions are poor. I hope the panel would comment on how this could affect our more global society. Mm. Microbes move with us. You know, they come with us and we deposit them in the normal way in our, our natural ecosystem of everywhere. I mean, most pathogens are transmitted fecal oral. And our, you know, we're a very touch sensitive species. So global travel is um, quite significant. The best example most recently is the 2009 pandemic influenza outbreak. We saw how quickly that spread from the, the primary focal point in Mexico with a tour group up to New York and then it went planet wide in the space of less than four months. And so I think the viewer is, is right on target. You know, if you create the conditions where you see the emergence of a, a microbe that has an opportunity, it's gonna move with whoever is, happens to be, be there touring or working or visiting or even emigrating to the developed world. And similarly, the developed world can bring its flora and fauna to, uh, depending on if you think bacteria are plants or animals, uh, to uh, the developing world, and it can then adapt there. And the best example there is, of course, the recent outbreak of E. coli in, in Germany that emerged out of Africa, but it really came from Europe and went to Africa and got busy, and then it went back. I absolutely agree, but I think there was a further point in the question about what happens in developing countries, and that's critical with antibiotics because they're often available over the counter, uh, the consumption mm -hmm. is unregulated, 
and what's more, the public health infrastructure in terms of clean water supply and sewage management is not good. So antibiotics are consumed in large quantity, select for resistance in the gut flora, which is then recycled through poor water management systems. Now, where that becomes critical is where you see a country, and India provides the great example here, where you're also seeing very rapid economic development. So at the one level you've got this poor water management, but at another you're seeing the, the growth of very sophisticated hospitals, very sophisticated medical services. And I do not see how they can isolate themselves from the food that they source, the patients they source, the staff they source, who ex outside the hospital are exposed to this milieu of circulating multi-resistant bacteria. So we're almost out of time here, but I would like to read one more question to the panel, and this is from a listener, Garrett, who writes, hey guys, I'm about to graduate with a BS in biology focused in microbiology. My question is, is it better to head straight to graduate school after finishing or get some actual lab experience in first? Or is grad school really even worth it, really? <laughs> Arturo, what do you think? <laughs> I think that um, I think that this is uh, not only a biological century, but it's going to become a microbiological century. And I think that, that there are going to be a lot of opportunities for a lot of very diverse types of work. In, in the field. so I, I don't think there's one answer to this. So mm -hmm. uh, there could be an incredibly interesting possibility before one goes to graduate school. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, there may be an opportunity in a group where the work is really advancing and you'd want to be there. So um, I think it's in your listeners' hands. Absolutely. It's, it's an individual answer. No, nobody can answer it perfectly for the question. But what I would say is, if Garrett is doubtful about what he wants to do at this stage, take the year out, work for a year, get the experience, then make the decision as to whether he wants to go back to graduate school and get the PhD. With a year's experience, yeah. he'll be much, much slicker and much more able to do the bench work to high quality, and he'll really know he's going back to graduate school because he wants to, not because, well, it's, you know, I'm at university, I may as well stay yeah. at university. I think that's a great suggestion. In fact, that's what I did. I graduated from college and wasn't sure if I liked lab work, so I went and worked in a lab for a year. And it me, cemented. Too. Me, me, me too. I, yeah. I got my BSc. I worked for what was then Burroughs Welcome for 18 mm -hmm. months, decided I wasn't going anywhere without a PhD, yep. and went back to university exactly. and did the PhD. There you go. So. Okay, so this episode will be posted at microbeworld.org slash TWIM, where you can also find our other podcasts, TWIV and TWIP, and where we also keep show notes for each episode. These podcasts are also available on iTunes and at the Zoom Marketplace. We also have an app for streaming these podcasts to your iPhone or Android device. You can find that at microbeworld.org slash app. We love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twim at twiv.tv or go over to microbeworld.org slash twim and leave a comment there. I'd like to thank everyone for participating today from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Arturo Casadeval. Thank you for inviting me. From Tufts University, Stuart Levy. Thank you very much. And David Livermore is at the HPA Center for Infections in London. Thank you so much, all three of you, for participating. And, of course, Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. Uh, I'm at virology.ws. I also want to thank Ray Ortega, Andrea, Chris Condayan, and Les for helping us today. ASM Communications head Barbara Hyde and Lindsey Grayson for making this happen. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.